So first, uh, we'll talk about the integumentary system. You know that human body consists of 11 systems and integumentary system is one of those systems that covers the whole body. First, we'll see the parts of the integumentary system. Then we'll talk about the functions of this system. Then the main organ of this system is the skin. So we'll talk about the skin. We'll talk about the types of the skin, structure of the skin, layers of the epidermis and dermis. Skin has two layers, outer epidermis, inner dermis. But each of those two layers has a number of sub-layers. So we'll see how many layers we have in the epidermis, how many layers in the dermis. We'll talk about the glands of the skin. Skin has three different types of glands. Okay, Sweat glands, there are two types of sweat glands and sebaceous gland. So those are three types of glands, we'll talk about that. Then we'll talk about the other structures in the skin. Most of the structures of the skin are found in the dermis, not in the epidermis, in the dermis, that means in the inner layer. So we'll see which other structures you have in the dermis. Then we'll talk about uh, the water loss through the skin. We know that we lose water from the body through the skin. So, how water leaves the body through the skin, we'll talk about that. First, uh, the parts. Main organ is the skin. Accessory structures include here, glands of the skin. Remember, glands means glands of the skin here and nails. Functions. Protection. By covering the body, whole body, your skin protects the internal body structures from outside harms. Three types of protections are given by the skin. Chemical protection, physical or mechanical protection and biological protection. Chemical protection, skin secretes low pH chemicals, that means slightly acidic and that inactivate or kill the microorganisms. So, by secreting acidic mantle, skin protects your body. That's the chemical protection. Skin has some phagocytic cells. So, inside the skin, you have some cells they can do phagocytosis and golf. Make sense? So, through those phagocytic cells, the skin provide biological protection. That means we all have those phagocytic cells in the skin. Those are the parts of your body, biology. What are the phagocytic cells that provide biological protection or barrier? Dendritic cells and macrophages. So, if somehow the microorganism or antigen can enter into the skin, then those cells will 
try to destroy them. Another type of protection is given by the skin is the physical or mechanical. Skin has certain chemicals. One is called keratin, highly specialized protein. That keratin and another is glycolipids. Especially these two chemicals, keratin is a highly specialized protein in the skin and glycolipid, that means glucose and lipid together from glycolipid. So protein and glucose and lipid all are there. So these two chemicals make the skin water resistant. That means the water cannot pass through the skin, cannot enter into the body through the skin. So that is a protection because you know that many microorganisms or antigens can stay in water, right? Dissolve in water and they can try to pass through the skin. But since the skin is water resistant, water cannot pass, that provides protection to your body. Will not the lay will not let the water or water soluble substances or microorganisms present in the water enter into the body. Uh, so those are three types of protections given by the skin. <clears throat> Regulation of body temperature. I already uh, talked about this when I went over all these systems, 11 system, by two ways, skin regulate or lowers the body temperature. One is if body temperature increases, sweating occurs from the skin and sweating takes a lot of heat out from the body. How? The sweat is mainly water and you know that water has high heat capacity. Small amount of water can take a lot of heat right in it. So, sweating can take a lot of heat out from the body and lowers the body temperature. So, that is one way. Another is when body temperature increases, vasodilatation right or vasodilation occurs throughout the skin. So, more blood circulates in the body surface and heat can easily, easily get out from the body from the blood. So, those are two ways your skin can lower the body temperature. <coughs> Cutaneous sensations. Skin houses cutaneous receptors pain touch temperature receptors and those sensations are given by those receptors. So very important, right? Metabolic functions. Skin produces cholecalciferol. I already had talked all this. Uh, so skin with the help of sun, sunlight, skin produces a chemical that is called cholecalciferol and that is an inactive vitamin D. So skin produces this with the help of sun and this inactive vitamin D goes to the kidneys where it is converted to calcic triol which is the active vitamin D. So this is how your skin helps in the synthesis of vitamin D. Excretion through the sweat, some toxic metabolic chemicals get out from the body. Small amount, although 
mostly they get out through the urine right most of the toxic chemicals but small amount gets out from the body through the skin so some <coughs> metabolic nitrogenous wastes and salts that's why the taste of so it is salty to you know uh, touch with your tongue you'll feel it it's weird salty taste because some nitrogenous toxics and salts get out through that so uh, types of skin we divide the skin in two ways one is by looking at the thickness thick skin and thin skin is and another way is by looking at the presence of hair hairy and non hairy skin thin skin covers most of the areas of your body thick skin uh, is present only in few areas for example in your palms of the hand and soles of your Good. Now, if you see the structure of a thick and thin skin, the main difference is in the epidermis, outer layer. In thick skin epidermis, you have a layer that is called stratum cornea. So this is your thin skin. This is epidermis. Epidermis. This is dermis. Okay. And this is your thick skin. So this is thin. This is thick. Again, this is epidermis, this is dermis. The difference is here in the epidermis. Thick skin epidermis is much thicker than the thin skin epidermis. Why? Because there is a layer here that is called stratum cornea. Stratum cornea. We'll talk about this later, just know that. In epidermis, stratum corneum in thick skin is very thick compared to the thin skin, and this layer mainly contributes the thickness of the thick skin. <coughs> so, the structure of the skin the skin has two layers outer epidermis, inner. Dermis, right? Under the dermis, you have another layer that is not a layer of the skin. Remember, this is called hypodermis. It is not a part of your skin. It is under the skin. So, if I ask you how many layers the skin has, two: outer epidermis and inner what? Dermis. So these are the two layers of the skin. Hypodermis is under the skin. Hypo, below. Okay, hypodermis is under the skin. Hypodermis contains lot of fat. So under the skin, you have adipose tissue or fat. Okay, so. <coughs> This hypodermis is also known as subcutaneous layer. Sub means below, hypo means below, under. So same thing. Cutaneous means skin. So under the skin. That's why we say subcutaneous. Cutaneous means skin. So hypodermis or subcutaneous layer contains a lot of what? Fats or adipose tissue, right? And there is a clinical importance of this layer. Subcutaneous injection, probably you have heard, right? Subcutaneous injection is given 
into this layer. So we use very thin needle for this and just under the skin, right? We push the drug. For example, insulin, right, is given subcutaneously. What's the significance of subcutaneous injection? Under the skin, you have fat in subcutaneous layer and when you inject the drug there, that will stay there for a long time and slowly will go to the blood because fat has less blood flow circulation, very small amount of blood flow, right? So, blood will go there but slowly take the medicine out. So, if you want any drug to work for longer time, several hours, you will prefer what? Subcutaneous. Make sense? But if you want immediate action, you will give intravenous, right? Directly go to the blood. If you want not too long, not too slow, intramuscular injection. Muscle has a lot of blood circulation. We will go there and take that out. Okay. <clears throat> Important structures present in the skin. Most of the skin structures are found in the dermis. As I have already mentioned, most of them are present in the dermis. What are the structures we see in the skin? Glands, hair follicles, hair roots, receptors, blood vessels, muscle. So, here you see this picture is showing the outer epidermis, inner thick dermis and under the dermis, hypodermis in the left side. You see epidermis, dermis and hypodermis, right? Now, you see most of the skin structures are present in the dermis. Which structures? You see the hair root, hair follicle. You see the glands, sweat glands, sebaceous glands. You see tiny muscles. The muscle of the skin is called erector pili or erector pili muscle. Those are small muscles help in what? Goosebump. What happens, you see, uh, this is your skin and this is a hair on the skin. And what happens, the muscle is attached to the hair follicle. So, when that muscle contacts, what happens, that pulls the hair follicle, right? Like this, and that helps in goosebump. So, that causes the goosebump. So, by the contraction of that muscle, this is the muscle, this is the hair. So, when the muscle will contact, it will erect the hair, right? So, this muscle helps in the erection of hair or goosebump. Uh, also, you see blood vessels, nerves, those structures are present in the dermis. One thing here is important, you see that blood vessels are only present in the dermis. In the epidermis, there is no blood vessel, no blood circulation. So, you have Blood circulation here, blood vessels are here in the dermis, but epidermis doesn't have any blood vessel. And you know that epidermis has, it is a tissue, so it has many living cells alive. Then how these cells get nutrition and oxygen? By diffusion from the dermis. Make sense? You must remember when I talked about the tissue, I said that epithelial tissue rests on the connective tissue and gets nutrition and oxygen by diffusion from underlying connective tissue. Same thing here. This is actually dermis is connective tissue and epidermis is epithelial tissue. So, that makes sense. The blood vessels are present here in the connective tissue dermis, but epidermis doesn't have any blood vessels but by diffusion, oxygen and nutrition go there. And that's why you'll see, you'll find many 
cells in the outermost layer of this epidermis is dead cells. You'll see many of these cells are dead cells, but these cells are alive. Why? Because by diffusion, these cells are getting oxygen nutrition easily, but as you go further outwards, these cells lack, right? Uh, doesn't, uh, don't get enough oxygen nutrition. So that's why many cells you'll find here are dead cells. Skin cells are dying all the time, right? So, most of the skin structures are present in the dermis. <coughs> Although, you see, epidermis is thin and dermis is much thicker than the epidermis, but epidermis has more layers in it. In thick skin epidermis, you have five layers. In thin skin, you have four layers. So, in the epidermis, you have four or five layers, depending on the type of the skin. In thin skin, you have how many? Four. In thick skin, you have five. Okay. Dermis has only two layers. Outer layer is the papillary layer. Outer layer is called the papillary layer and inner layer is called the reticular layer. Reticular layer. So dermis, although it is much thicker than the epidermis, but it has only two. Outer papillary and inner reticular. Outer papillary gives about 20% thickness of the dermis and inner reticular gives about 80% thickness of the dermis. Okay, so dermis has two layers, 20% thickness given by the papillary and 80% is given by the reticular. Yeah. Is it clear? Okay. Now, we will see the layers of the epidermis. There are how many layers in the epidermis? Four or five, right? Depending on the type of the skin. Okay. In thick skin, you have how many? Thick skin, five. And thin skin, four. We will see what are those five layers in the thick skin. From inside to outside, if you look from inside to outside, I am drawing again, this is dermis and this is epidermis. So, innermost layer of the epidermis is called stratum basal or basal layer. This layer consists of a single layer of stem cells. So, these are the stem cells. This layer is called stratum basale or basal layer. Since these cells in this layer are stem cells, you all know stem cells do what? Produce new cells, right? So, you will also know that outermost layer has many dead cells, right? Cells are dying. So, those cells get out, right? Shed out and new cells are produced from here. So, once the new cells are produced, they start to move upwards to replace the dead cells. Is it clear? To replace the dead cells. So, this is the importance of this layer, producing new cells. Once a new cell is produced from these stem cells, it takes about 25 to 45 days from here to reach here. That means from innermost to outermost layer, it takes 25 to 45 days. The next layer is the stratum spinosum. This layer consists of the cells those cells have 
spiky cell membrane. So look like this. Many spines. That's why this layer is called spinosa, also known as prickly layer. So the cell surface is spiky. So stratum spinosa and lot of melanin granules are present inside these cells. So melanin is what? Pigment, right? Melanin is a pigment that gives the color of the skin. So the melanin pigments are present inside the cells in this layer. Also, this layer has dendritic cells. You remember I said two types of phagocytic cells, right? Present in the skin. One is macrophage, another is dendritic, right? So, this layer contains a lot of phagocytic cells, dendritic cells. So, those two things in this layer. Next layer is stratum granulosa. So, in this layer, you can see the cells, those cells are filled with granules, that's why it is called granulosa. Granules are small chemical particles, very tiny, right? So, these cells are filled with small chemical particles or granules, that's why it is called stratum granulosa. Okay. Two types of granules are abundant. One is keratohyalin and another is called lamellated granules. So those are two types of granules present in granulosa. Yes, remember. And these two layers are mainly, sorry, these two granules are mainly giving you, your skin, the waterproofness. You remember keratin, we talked about that by highly specialized proteins. So, keratohyalin and lamellated granules mostly makes the, make the skin waterproof or water resistant. So, that's the function. Next layer is stratum lucidum. This layer is only present in thick skin only present in thick skin, stratum lucidum, not present in thin skin. This layer is also known as glassy or clear layer. It's like a glass, transparent, transparent layer. That's why it is also known as clear layer. And only present in the thick skin epidermis. Many dead keratinocytes are present in this layer. Dead cells. Those cells are keratinocytes. Remember, site means what? Cells, right? Site means cell. Keratinocytes. That means these cells produce what? Keratin. Keratin is what I have already mentioned? Protein. Highly specialized protein, right? That makes the waterproofness, right? So, from where the keratin comes? Keratinocytes. Is it clear? These cells produce keratin. That highly specialized protein. That makes the skin waterproof. So, the keratinocytes are present, but most of these keratinocytes in this layer are dead keratinocytes. Outermost layer. This layer, you remember, I said, is responsible for the thickness. That's the stratum cornea, responsible for the thickness. This layer is very thick in thick skin, thin in thin skin. So, thick skin is thick because of this layer. This layer The 
consists of many layers of dead squamous catenized cells. Now remember, in last layer, we saw keratinocytes. I am going back again. In last stratum lucidum, you saw keratinocytes, right? These are the cells produce what? Keratin. Here, in cornium, you see keratinized cells, not keratinocytes. What are the keratinized cells? <coughs> These are the squamous cells, flat, you know, squamous cells are flat, right? They get filled with keratin. They don't produce keratin. They get filled with what? Keratin. So, keratinocytes produce keratin and keratin enter into these squamous cells and these cells become keratinized cells. So, when these squamous cells get filled with keratin, they become keratinized cells. So, we can say that uh, this is flat squamous cell and these are the keratinocytes, okay? So, keratinocytes produce and secrete keratin. So, keratin is produced by keratinocytes, these cells, and the keratin gets out and then enter into these squamous cells. Now, these cells get filled with keratin and become keratinized cells. So, these are keratinocytes, keratin producing cells, and these flat cells are keratinized cells. Now, keratinized once they get filled with keratin. Make sense? And this process is called keratinization. How the squamous cells get filled with keratin. This process is called what? Keratinization. So very simple. Is it clear? Make sense? Do you understand? Okay. So how many types of cells you have found related to keratin? Two. One, keratin producing cells, those are called what? Keratinocytes. And those cells don't produce keratin, but they get filled with keratin. Those are keratinized cells, right? So, in stratum corneum, you have many layers of keratinized cells. Again, many dead cells are present in this layer. These are squamous, that means flat cells of the skin. So, the outermost layer is giving the waterproofness because a lot of keratin is present inside these keratinized cells. Okay? And also, this layer provides the protection against any mechanical uh, harm. Okay, <clears throat> so here you see uh, the thick and thin skin. I already showed you in thick skin, the stratum corneum is very thick. In thin skin, stratum corneum is thin. So you see the left side's picture is the thin skin and right side is the thick skin. Okay. Another thing you need to know. Thick skin epidermis has stratum lucidum, thin skin epidermis doesn't, right? So, the dermis has two layers, outer papillary, inner reticular. Papillary gives how much thickness? 20% and reticular gives 80% thickness. So, we have talked about that already. Uh, we have already seen this picture of the skin. Now, the outer papillary layer of the dermis that gives 20% thickness is formed by loose areolar type connective tissue. We have seen this tissue under the microscope as well as in picture, right? Areolar. So, it is a loose type connective tissue. 
that's why the papillary layer is soft in a reticular layer 80% thickness is given by this and it is formed by dense irregular connective tissue you also know dense irregular dense regular right so in dense type connective tissue the fibers are heavily packed that's why this layer is hard so outer papillary is formed by loose areolar inner reticular is formed by dense irregular so which one is soft papillary layer makes sense because it is formed by loose type connective tissue and that's why the chance of getting inflammation is very high in papillary layer number 1 it is the outer layer right number 2 it is a soft layer so easily can get inflammation microorganisms can also easily spread in papillary layer but cannot penetrate cannot pass through the reticular layer easily so that's why dermatitis which is the inflammation of the dermis usually occurs due to the damage of or injury of the papillary layer of the dermis because this layer is soft what a loss skin color oh what a loss so we lose water from the body in many ways you know that and we can divide the water loss into two types of water loss one is insensible water loss and another is sensible water loss insensible water loss are the water loss that we don't see or feel that we are losing water from the body that we don't see or feel makes sense can you give me an example when you talk you lose water when you breathe you lose water but you don't see or you don't feel that you are losing water makes sense sensible urination when you urinate you see water is leaving the body right so you feel that so insensible as well as sensible those both ways we lose water from the body here are some examples of insensible uh talk breathe evaporation through the skin through the skin both sensible and insensible water loss occur sensible is sweating right when sweating occurs you see you feel that so it but through the skin also by evaporation 24 hours we are losing some water we don't see that even when you are resting right no sweating water is leaving through the skin by evaporation so you see here uh through the skin we lose water both insensible as well as sensible evaporation is insensible sweating is sensible skin color the number of pigments are responsible for the skin color one the most important one is the melanin melanin is a brown to dark colored pigment so the color of melanin is brown to dark and this one is mainly responsible for the skin color melanin is produced by the cells of the skin those cells are called melanocytes so melanocytes produce melanin is it clear keratinocytes produce what keratin makes sense so melanocytes and keratinocytes both are present in the skin right keratinocytes produce keratin that protein highly specialized that makes the skin what waterproof and melanocytes produce what melanin that is responsible for what skin color color of the skin so if someone has more melanin cells the skin color will be what darker if someone has lack of melanin cells the skin color will be less dark or white okay so 
this is the main pigment. Now, uh, melanin is very important. It protects your skin against UV radiation. So, if someone has more melanin in the skin, that means the skin is dark, that is more protected, right? Against what? UV radiation. Melanin makes a layer that is called the protecting shield or pigment shield that prevents the UV radiation from entering to the deeper layers of the epidermis. You know stem cells earlier, we have talked about that. So, the UV will not reach there easily. Carotid, another type of pigment present in the skin but a small amount. In human skin, this pigment is present in small amount. The color is yellow to orange. And this pigment uh, in human body is mostly present in the palms and soles, but in small amount. In some uh, vegetables or fruits, you have plenty of carotene. For example, oranges, right? The color is orange. Carrot. The color is orange because of carrot. Hemoglobin is also responsible for the skin color. If more blood circulates in the skin, you know that the skin color turns what? Reddish. Less blood circulates in the skin, the skin color becomes what? Pale. Right? So, the flow of blood also is responsible for the color of the skin. Uh, you know that in the blood, the pigment that is called the hemoglobin is responsible for the red color of the blood. So, more hemoglobin, more blood flow will make the skin color reddish. Less hemoglobin, less blood flow will make the skin color pale. And that is one way, you know, that by looking at the skin color, the doctors can tell, right? Or we can say that this person has less hemoglobin, anemia, right? We say if the color of the skin is pale. So, we know that hemoglobin also contributes to the skin color. <coughs> okay. Um, clinical in implications of the skin color. By looking at the color of the skin, we can diagnose few clinical conditions. One I have already mentioned, right? If you see the skin is pale, that could be due to anemia, right? Lack of hemoglobin. Hypertension. Flushed skin, particularly the face area. If you see um, the face, the person's uh, blood pressure is high, you will see the face flushed, right? So, that tells you that this person might have hypertension, high blood pressure. Jaundice is the yellow coloration of the skin and mucous membrane. So, if you see someone's skin is turning yellowish, you can suspect that this person might have jaundice. Jaundice occurs due to, the yellow coloration occurs due to bilirubic, the pigment that is called Okay. If the bilirubin concentration is high, that gives the yellowish coloration of the skin because the color of bilirubin is here. <coughs> Sinosis. This one occurs due to increased carbon dioxide in the body. Bluish coloration of the skin. The skin color turns to bluish. 
Sometimes you will see infants, very small baby, right? If cries for a long time, the skin turns bluish because breathing stops and uh, carbon dioxide concentration increases, oxygen is less. So that is the cyanosis. <coughs> okay, so those are the clinical conditions we can diagnose by looking at the color of the skin. Now, I will talk about the glands of the skin. Skin has three different types of glands. Two types of sweat glands and sebaceous gland that I mentioned at the very beginning, right? So, the way these three glands secrete the chemicals is different from each other. So, those three types of glands of the skin secrete the chemicals in three different ways. One is called merocrine type secretion. That's why those are merocrine type glands. Another is apocrine type secretion. We will talk about this. And another type of skin glands secret holocrine type secretion. So, three. Merocrine secretion, apocrine secretion, holocrine type secretion. So, those are three types of secretions or three modes of secretion, ways of secretion. So, we will see what are those three modes or ways of secretion. First, we will see merocrine type secretion. In this type of secretion, what happens, the cells of the gland, so these are the cells of the gland, okay, what happens, these cells produce the chemicals that will be secreted and what happens, uh, the chemicals enter into the vesicles. So, these cells have vesicles. So, after the chemicals are formed, they enter into the vesicles. You know the vesicles. And these vesicles do what? They move towards the upper end of the cells, apical end. So, now the vesicles are here. And then next what happens, the rupture of the vesicle occurs and that releases the chemicals to the outside. So, the chemicals enter into the vesicles, get, vesicles get filled with the chemicals, vesicles move to the apical end or upper end and then rupture. So, that releases the chemical to the outside. So, this type of secretion that rupture is called exocytosis. You already know exocytosis. Okay. So, this type of secretion is called merocrine type secretion. Merocrine type. Another type of secretion that is called apocrine. You see what happens. These are the cells in the gland. The chemicals are produced inside the cells. No vesicles are here. What happens next? These chemicals move to the upper end of these cells. Accumulate at the upper end. Like this. And then what happens? The entire upper surface of these cells shed and destroyed. So, what happens? The cell membrane of the upper portion of these cells are destroyed. So, whole upper portion of these cells are destroyed and these chemicals, since they are present in the upper end, will be released. So, this type of secretion is called apocrine type due to complete destruction of the upper portion of the cells. Okay. 
Now, holocrine. Holocrine situation occurs due to complete death or, or destruction of the cells. So, these cells are filled with the chemicals and what happens? The whole cells are destroyed. So, completely the cells are destroyed, chemicals will come out. Now, here in these glands, you have a stem cells. So, once these cells are completely destroyed, dead, these stem cells will produce new cells again. Okay? They will get filled with chemicals again, will be destroyed again, new cells will be produced. So, that is the holocrine type secretion. Do you know the word holocast, the death, right? Acid death. So, have you heard this word? Holocast. Yeah, right. Killing. So, these cells are being destroyed entirely. So, that's the holocrine type secretion. So, these are three ways, three types of skin glands secrete the chemicals. That's why you need to know the types of secretion. Now, you know that the skin has sweat glands and sebaceous gland. Sweat glands, there are two types. <coughs> Acrine sweat glands, they do what kind of secretion? Merocrine type secretion. That means they produce vesicles and release the chemicals by exocytosis. Is it clear? The apocrine sweat glands do apocrine type secretion. The upper portion is destroyed. And sebaceous gland do what? Holocrine type secretion. So, sebaceous glands do holocrine type secretion. So, those are three types of glands of the skin and they secrete in three different ways. A kind of glands or merocrine, apocrine and sebaceous glands do holocrine. Now, a kind of glands secrete sweat. So, sweat comes out from the eccrine sweat glands or secreted by eccrine sweat glands. Sweat is 99% water. That means mainly water. I mentioned it before. And that's why when sweat gets out from the body, it takes a lot of heat out from it. Sweat also has metabolic waste, antibodies, vitamin C, sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is the salt. We have talked about that, right? The sweat, if you touch with your skin, it's salty. And metabolic waste, we have also talked about this. But remember, vitamin C and antibodies are present here too. <coughs> Function is thermoregulation. We already know that sweating lowers the heat in the body, lowers the body temperature. So that is thermoregulation. Thermo means temperature regulation. Epocrine sweat glands are confined to the axillary and anogenital areas. So, those areas are areas are more closed, don't get enough flow, air flow in those areas. You have epocrine sweat glands, and epocrine sweat glands. Apocrine sweat glands um, contains oily chemicals or substances. And also know that apocrine sweat gland secretion has antibodies. So they can kill the microorganisms. You know the chance of microorganisms uh, to grow in confined areas is more high. So this secretion can inactivate or kill the microorganisms. <coughs> Sebaceous gland, widely distributed and mostly developed from the hair follicles. That's why we see that 
sebaceous glands are attached to the hair follicles. I will show you. Uh, just know that uh, mostly develop from the hair follicles, grow from the hair follicles, and become active at puberty. And the secretion, the name of secretion is called sebum. And the sebum is also oily secretion. It is holocrine type of secretion. We have talked about that. And it has bactericidal action. That means can kill the bacteria, destroy the bacteria. Since this is oily secretion, it also softens your hair and the skin. So skin, if secretion, sebaceous secretion is more, the skin is softer. Hair is soft. So keeps the hair and the skin soft and oily. So uh, this one is not responsible for thermoregulation. Here you see in this picture the sebaceous glands are attached to the hair follicles. This part is the hair follicle, so these are the sebaceous glands, so attached to the hair follicles. Uh, in the left side you see the histology. If you make a slide and see under the microscope, you see the hair follicle and the sebaceous gland. Inside the sebaceous gland, you have the secretory cells. Now, since the sebaceous gland does holocrine type of secretion, what happens? All these secretory cells are destroyed, right? Holocrine. And you have stem cells around them. Those stem cells produce new cells again. So, you know, female breast secrete the milk also by holocrine type of secretion. The cells are destroyed, the new cells are produced. Okay. Okay, so that's all about the skin. Now, uh, quickly, uh, I will talk about the hair. Hair uh, has three parts. So if you see a hair, it has three parts. The part you can see from outside, that is called the shaft of the hair. This, this is the shaft part of the hair. So this is the shaft and now inside the skin you have hair follicle and hair root. So this is the shaft, it's the skin, outside of the skin shaft. This is the follicle and this is the root. So those are the three parts of a hair. Now this shaft actually goes in like this. So inside the follicle you also have your shaft. The so shaft goes inside the follicle. Now if I see the structure of the hair shaft, it has three layers, outermost middle layer and inner layer. So it has from outside to inside three layers in it. Outermost layer is called the cuticle. So cuticle is the outermost layer of the shaft and that gives the shiny appearance of the hair, right? The outer layer that's responsible for the shiny look of the hair. Then middle layer is called the cortex. So under the cuticle, you have the cortex. And innermost part is called the medulla. Medulla. Okay. So those are the three layers in the shaft part of the skin. Outermost cuticle, middle cortex and innermost medulla. Now, so if I make a cross section, cut like this, I will see like this. Outermost cuticle, then cortex, then medulla. Okay. Outside itself. <coughs> now, if I make a cross section here, you see, if here follicle, then what I will see? I will see the shaft inside, that means those three layers inside, shaft has those three layers, but additional layers, 
are around. So follicle has additional layers around the shaft. So you will see these three but also there are three other layers in the follicle. So additional layers. So this is the cross section of the follicle. So first you see inner part where you have the shaft. So you have the medulla from inside to outside. Innermost is the medulla, then the cortex, then the cuticle. So those are three layers of the shaft part. And then additional layers are what? <coughs> Internal epithelial root sheet, external epithelial root sheet, glassy membrane, and then outermost connective tissue layer. So those are four additional layers around the shaft. In the follicle, you have other layers. Two root, root sheet, inner and outer root sheet. And then you have glassy membrane, transparent membrane. Then you have the connective tissue layer. So just remember that way. Two root sheet, inner epithelial root sheet, outer epithelial root sheet, then glassy membrane, then connective tissue. That is the types of hair. Uh, in human body, we see two types of hair, valus and terminal hair. Valus is very soft, fine, pale color here to children and women, adult females. Terminal hair are coarse, thick hair of the body. For example, the hair of your scalp, eyebrow, axillary area, pubic region, those are thick hair. So, those are two types of hair. Now, baldness is uh, something, you know, some people are very serious <laughs> about it, right? So, uh, loss of hair, absence of hair, yes, right? That's the baldness, very simple. Absence of hair due to loss of hair. Now, there are two types of baldness. One type of baldness occurs in everybody when we get old, right? When we get older, after age 40, we start to lose hair, everybody. That is called alopecia. Thinning of hair in all sexes, both male and female. Another type of baldness that occurs only in few people, that's the true or frank baldness. Mostly occur in male. Complete loss of hair. So the scalp is very, you know, shiny. <laughs> so that is true or frank baldness. Uh, this one is a genetical problem occurs due to the genes. If the parent has that gene, that will be transmitted to the offspring, children. And children will eventually, when they will get old, they will get the chance of getting the frank true baldness is high. So it is genetically determined, right? Linked. Uh, the gene that is responsible for this increases the production of a chemical that is called di or dehydrotestosterone. This is a precursor of male sex hormone testosterone. So dihydrotestosterone is the chemical that is responsible for that and that gene uh, can increase the production of that hormone and if that hormone production is more then that inhibits the hair follicles to grow the hair. So that's the reason of true or frank baldness. Okay? Temperature regulation, just know, we know how the skin regulates the temperature 
sweating and increasing the blood flow uh, both lower the body temperature now we know that but we don't know who is telling the sweat gland to secrete right who is telling the blood vessels to dilate we don't know that that is the brain in your brain you have a structure that is called the hypothalamus that sense when the body temperature increases you must remember we talked about that homeostasis right if body temperature increases right your receptors detect that send signal to the brain control center right control center send signal to the effector right to the sweat gland so in this case the control center is the hypothalamus of the brain so hypothalamus tells the sweat gland to secrete the sweat and how much sweating should occur right hypothalamus send signal to the blood vessels to dilate so more blood will flow in the skin so very important structure in the brain that is responsible for the regulation of body temperature that is the hypothalamus tells the sweat gland to sweat tells the blood vessels to dilate <coughs> now you see here inside the skin you already know that you have the this is the skin and you have in the dermis you have the sweat gland so this is the sweat gland sweat gland and from the sweat gland a tube that arises and go to the skin surface this is called the sweat duct duct is the tube so sweat duct okay and this opening of that duct in the skin surface is called what pore sweat pore so gland secretes then the sweat gets out to the outside of the skin through the pore when uh, the body temperature is low what happens the sweat duct as well as the pore constrict get narrow so the constriction of the duct as well as the constriction of the pore occurs so the pore gets almost closed so no sweating can occur in cold weather or if your body is cold makes sense you don't want sweating because sweating will take the heat out right so the duct constricts strongly and also the sweat pore constricts strongly so it almost get closed so no sweating can occur so that is important um, to prevent for the loss of heat from the body <coughs> dermatitis is the inflammation of the papillary layer of the dermis because that layer is soft we have talked about that uh, skin cancer or carcinoma of the skin is commonly heard three types of skin cancer are commonly seen <coughs> basal cell carcinoma squamous cell carcinoma and yeah melanoma so those are three types of carcinoma or skin cancer now the risk factors of skin cancer are I have mentioned one already, right? UV radiation, excessive exposure to UV radiation uh, can cause that because UV radiation can pass through the outer layers of the skin and can cause damage to the inner layers. Frequent irritation of the skin. Now, if you irritate your skin frequently by certain chemical, how you know those people? work to build the road or fix the road right they use the tar chemical if you touch that chemical every day that can right irritate the skin every day and can change the structure of the cells that can lead to 
abnormal multiplication that is the cancer uncontrolled abnormal multiplication of the cells can be caused by frequent irritation chemical irritation i gave you the example mechanical irritation if something is scratching your skin all the time that can change the behavior of the cell or structure of the cell um, <coughs> so basal cell carcinoma is the most common type skin cancer or carcinoma but good news is that least malignant malignant means least malignant means least harmful malignancy uh, the term we use malignancy to indicate metastosis metastosis means once the cancer occurs the abnormal cells if they invade into deeper tissue spread quickly right that is called metastasis the so more metastasis means more danger right so the basal cell carcinoma is least metastasis occurs in this type of cancer so least malignant least harmful less dangerous squamous cell carcinoma is second most common more metastasis occurs than basal cell but less than melanoma and most dangerous is melanoma so melanoma in melanoma we see metastasis most malignancy <coughs> basal cell carcinoma you must remember stratum basale inner most layer of the epidermis where you have a single layer of stem cells we have talked about that if those cells start to qualify as abnormal that is the basal cell carcinoma stratum basale layer we have talked about that this layer uh, can be cured by surgical incision about 99% success rate So you can, if you surgically remove the tissue from there, the patient will get cured. Squamous cell carcinoma involves keratinocytes in stratum spinosum. You must remember the layer spinosum. The cells have spikes, right? So if those cells start to proliferate abnormally, that leads the squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, those are keratinocytes those cells keratin producing cells anyway so mostly seen in certain areas scalp ears lower lip and hands good prognosis if treated by radiation and removed surgically so you can remove surgically or you can apply radiation to kill the cells abnormal cells since the metastosis is not very high you can kill the cells easily or remove the cells easily right but if metastasis occurs lot of metastasis that means that abnormal cells have already uh, invaded further melanoma occurs due to abnormal yes metastasis is that the abnormal tissue cells if they go further away from the site okay so that is dangerous right spread occurs quickly melanoma uh, occurs due to abnormal proliferation of the melanocytes you already know melanocytes keratinocytes we have talked about that right so melanocytes produce melanin that's why by looking at the color of the skin you can tell melanoma because melanocytes these cells produce melanin so if these cells are many more melanin will be produced in that area makes sense so the color of the skin will be dark in that area so by looking at the color you can tell 
highly metastatic and also highly resistant to chemotherapy. So this type of cancer is difficult to treat by chemotherapy or radiation. So you need widespread surgical removal. Since metastasis is high, the spread of abnormal tissue or cell is high. So you have to remove a lot of tissue. Not only from that area you can see from outside because you might have abnormal cells further away from that site. So you have to make widespread surgical excision or removal. Okay, so those are three types of skin car carcinoma or cancers. Now we'll talk about the burn. Another thing we hear very often and since the skin covers the body, right? So uh, burn usually damage the skin. So burns damage the skin. Uh, by looking at the layer of the skin got damaged, we classify the burn into three types. First degree, second degree and third degree. By looking at the damage of the layer. We know that skin has two layers, epidermis and dermis. So, in first degree burn, only epidermis is affected. In second degree burn, epidermis and part of dermis is affected or damaged. In third degree burn, that is the most severe condition where both the epidermis and dermis are completely damaged or affected. So, in this case, since the whole skin, both layers are destroyed, you might need to do grafting, transplantation, take a skin from another part of the body and place there. Because the stem cells are also destroyed, no stem cells are left there to produce the skin, in third degree burn. In third degree burn, since the entire skin is destroyed, both layers, the sensory receptors, the cutaneous receptors are destroyed, right? The blood vessels are destroyed, so no sensation, no feeling, no pain sensation is there. Uh, in first degree burn, we see redness. in that area. So, you see in the fingers of this patient, um, you see the redness, that means the first degree burn in the finger areas. In second degree burn, you will see blisters. So, white patches and edema. So, uh, in the palm, you see second degree burn. And third degree burn, uh, this one is kind of scary, right? Third degree burn. The entire skin is destroyed or damaged. So, you have to do the grafting in this case. Okay. Now, uh, another way we determine the amount of burn that is called 9% rule, rule of 9. So this is the head. Now my picture is not there. <laughs> so this is the neck. Okay, the body, the person, and this is the trunk. Right, and, uh, lower limbs. Not bad, right? Okay, the upper limbs. So uh, this is nine percent. The head part, the skin in your head part, and then trunk is 9% top, 9% the bottom of the front, same in the back. So, 4 nines, right? 2 nines in the front and 2 nines in the back. Here, upper limb, 9%, 9% in 
9%. Okay. So how many we got? 1, 4, 5, 6, 7. And the leg, the front of the leg is 9% back of the leg is another 9%. So each leg is 2 9%. And then here 9% and 9%. So 4, 4, 8, 9, 10, 11. So 9, 11 is 99%, right? 9 times 11, 99%. And the perineal area, the genital area is only 1%. The skin in this area is considered as 1%. 99% plus 1% is 100%. Right? So that's how we determine how much skin area is affected. If the whole head skin of the whole head is damaged, it's a 9%. Right? So that is the 9% rule to determine the skin got affected by the bar. Okay, so just remember, uh, this is another way we determine the amount of burn. Now, um, we'll talk about the male. I know some of you love the male, right? Like uh, take care of male, spend a lot of time and money, right? To make the male beautiful. So, very important. Uh, I will uh, not talk much about this because I don't like it. Okay. Uh, so, very briefly, uh, just uh, know the parts of the nail. We don't see the whole nail from outside. Only part of it we can see from outside. Okay. A uh, lot of structures are inside the fingers. So, we don't see. Uh, so, nail has following structures, body, free edges, root, nail force, uh, nasium, which is called cuticle, hyponasium, nail bed, lunula. Lunula is the white crescent area in the back of the nail. So, here you see some of those structures from outside. You can see the free edge that extends beyond the fingertip, right? That's, that is not supported by the bed, so no support underneath. So that's the free edge. Then behind that, proximal to that is the body of the nail, which has bed under it. So that's the nail body. Then lunula is that white crescent area. So those are three areas you can see from outside, three parts. In both sides of the nail body, you have the folds, lateral nail folds in both sides of the body. And behind the lunula, you have another fold that is called the proximal nail fold. So those are the folds around the nail. And the uh, under the body, of the nail, you have the bed that supports the body. So that's the nail bed under. It. Okay. Now you see the nail goes inside the finger too. So from lunula, if you look further backwards, you see the nail goes inside the finger, and that part as uh, that part is called the nail root. Okay? Nail root is the innermost part that we don't see from outside. Okay? And from the nail root area, the nail grows because uh, you have the stem cells there. Now, the part of the nail you see from outside is dead because this part has dead keratinized cells only. No living cells are there. So that's why you can cut it, right? Without pain, no pain. Here, dead keratinized cells. So remember, your nail, your hair, those are formed by what? Dead 
keratinized cells. You must remember keratinized cells get filled with keratin, right? So these cells are heavily filled with keratin. Plenty of keratin is inside, both in the hair and in the nail. Now the question is then why nail color is different than the color of the hair because both are keratinized cells, right? Because in here you have what? Melanin. In here you have melanin. In nail, no melanin is there. So this is actually the real color of that protein keratin, the nail. You know, in egg, the protein, the white part, right? That's the protein. So that's the real color of protein, pure protein. Okay. So the nail doesn't have any uh, melanin, only keratin. But here, the keratin gets mixed with melanin. That's why the color of here is here is colorful. Okay. So uh, dead keratin is there. small amount of tissue that connects the free is to the fingertip that is called hyponesia. The small amount of tissue we see that uh, connects the fingertip to the nail and small amount of tissue that connects the lunula to the skin that is the eponesia. So those are small tissue structures. Okay, so makes sense? So that's about all about the nail. Yes.